I mean, these TED guys really know how to put on a show, don't they? So, this guy's my hero. This guy is named Sebastian... Sorry, his name is... <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think of him like Sebastian. No, his name is Ignacio Semmelweis. He was an obstetrician in Vienna in the 1840s. And he was assigned to the, the uh, Vienna Maternity uh, Hospital, which was at the time the biggest hospital maternity hospital in the world. And that hospital had two clinics. It had one which was staffed by doctors and one which was staffed by midwives. And when Semmelweis arrived there, he noticed something very unusual, that the death rate amongst women who were treated by the doctors was somewhere around 15 to 20 percent. The death rate amongst the women treated by the midwives was about 3 percent. What was the difference? He hypothesized there must have been something about the physician's hands. Why is that? Because in the mornings, the physicians were doing autopsies on corpses, and in the afternoons and the evenings, they were delivering babies. So Semmelweis had this idea that why don't we get physicians to wash their hands? So he developed a small truck. <laughs> I know it seems radical. So he, uh, he instituted a policy of where they would wash their hands with this chlorine solution. The death rate within weeks dropped almost to zero. Now, was Semmelweis treated as a hero, as a champion? No, he was actually ostracized. He was ridiculed. He was rejected by his profession. And in fact, one of the leading obstetricians of the day said that it was preposterous that doctors could be hurting their patients because doctors have clean hands. He said, doctors are gentlemen, and gentlemen's hands are clean. <laughs> I point this out because when you try to challenge established medical practice, you're often uh, seen as, as a rebel. And I have a little bit of a rebel tendency myself. Um, uh, I started doing drug policy research in 1993 uh, when I was asked to work on this uh, small research project when I was in university. Uh, this was after I got out of the Navy, because I basically needed to get a real job. And uh, a, a colleague of mine asked me, would you work on this small study? Six months long, no problem. Um, I only say this to the students, because if you say yes to something, 19 years later, you could still be doing the same thing. <laughs> which is what happened to me. So um, when I started working on this project, I, I decided I need to learn something about the pharmaceutical industry. If you're studying drug policy, and I found some very fascinating things. The most fascinating, perhaps, is that you know, modern healthcare is really about taking prescription drugs. It's really kind of how we defined care. You know, two-thirds of visits to a doctor end in a prescription drug, whether it's a new drug, a free sample, uh, a refill. That's an awful lot of drugs. We consume something like $30 billion worth of pharmaceuticals in Canada every year. At the same time, we want the decisions around drugs to be made in a fairly informed way. And uh, the other thing that I discovered is that a lot of times that physicians are influenced by the pharmaceutical industry, and that when they've studied the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, they discover that, guess what? The doctors that have the closest contact, the, who go to the meals, who are wined and dined and otherwise have interactions with the pharmaceutical industry are actually the worst prescribers. Okay, I have to give a little bit more uh, biography here. So I'm the, I'm the youngest of four children. This, this is relevant, work with me here. Um, <laughs> that's me on the right, uh, my brother and sister. My sister, by the way, the second one on the right, she's getting married tomorrow, so I can tell you. I've got a busy weekend. Uh, so one, one, uh, one summer, when I was almost two, my dad said, we need to get a swimming pool. So he went and bought a swimming pool. And as you see... <laughs> The pool wasn't quite big enough for four kids, and those meanies wouldn't let me in. And so my mother, and of course, this is part of the family mythology, my mother said, you weren't upset. You went and made something happen. You went, you found a bucket, you filled it with water, and you sat in it. <laughs> this is a metaphor for my life. I'm sitting in my own bucket. <laughs> okay. But when I talk, the theme being emergence, I'm talking about the champions of, of, of medicine's next revolution. And I'm here to tell you that the bucket's getting bigger. The pool's getting bigger. There's more and more of us in there. 
Um, somebody like this person, Dr. Warren Bell. Now, Warren is one of the best doctors you'll ever meet. He's a GP, practices up in Salmon Arm. He founded the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. He's one of the most intelligent doctors that I have ever met, and he has never seen a pharmaceutical rep in his practice in 37 years. He tells me that when he was in uh, medical school, when there were when the, the, the drug uh, representatives were sort of floating around, actually he has an Eli Lilly uh, stethoscope, he said that he found it very offensive the first time that they said to him, here, have some free samples. How else can we help you? And he realized that it was so offensive to him because they were treating him not as a, as a, as a person, they were treating him as a political thing because they knew that if they influence the doctor, then he will in, that will influence the prescribing that he, uh, that he does. Now, Warren Bell doesn't see f f uh, pharmaceutical reps, there's no logos in his office, but does he know a lot about drugs and alternatives? Actually, when a patient comes in, the patient does not have a logo stamped on their forehead. It's a real patient, and he can think of possibly drugs, possibly alternatives. And so that's the kind of doctor I think that we want. Um, you know, th there are other physicians out there, including doctors who have worked for the pharmaceutical industry. Now, this guy is a real, well, he's an incredible guy. Peter Goetz, uh, he's a physician in uh, Denmark, works in uh, Copenhagen. He's the head of the uh, Danish Cochrane Collaboration. Um, he's a very intense guy. When he looks, he's got these deep blue eyes, and he's, he's very stern, and he's very serious. He'll say to me stuff like, I, I met him at a conference in Madrid a number of years ago. He'll say, Alan, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't sell drugs. It sells lies about drugs. What do you really feel, Peter? <laughs> you know, and he tells the story in his book, uh, Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime. Again, what do you really think, Peter? Uh, he, he tells this story when he uh, was in university, or just got out of university, and uh, started working for a company uh, called Astra Syntex. He worked first as a, as a drug salesman, and then he worked on the research side. And on the research side, he discovered that, you know what, a lot of the research that we're doing on these drugs is very biased. We're not comparing drugs to equivalents of other types. We're taking studies that we're doing, and when they show the drug not to be favorable, we hide those studies. And he became very upset. In fact, he wrote a, he ended up going into a, a PhD thesis, which was entitled uh, uh, Bias in, in Randomized Clinical Trials. Peter says in his book that pharmaceuticals are the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer, which is a very bold statement, but he backs it up with very good, I think, statistical analysis. The third leading cause of death. He also says that most of what physicians know about drugs has been laundered, has been concocted, has been dressed up by the pharmaceutical industry. Now, what can we do against this kind of bias in, 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 in prescribing and what we know about drugs? We have a couple of groups around the world, including this person, uh, Barbara Mincy's, who works for a group called Therapeutics Initiative, which is at UBC. And this group does independent research on, uh, on drugs. They advise the government on which drugs are good and what the problems are. And you know, the Therapeutics Initiative, they're, they're unique in the sense that they have, done some, they have done some very interesting analyses on very important drugs. This drug, by the way, came to the market in 1999. It goes by the generic name Rofacoxib, uh, which you might know by the name of Viox. This drug was on the market for a little over five years. It came to the market with huge amounts of hoopla and marketing uh, dollars, really. In fact, most of the rheumatologists uh, had been consultants for the company or had been paid by the company to help market this, tr this treatment. Um, Viox was withdrawn from the market in September of 2004 after having discovered that this drug was causing excess heart attacks. And in fact, they estimate that more than 60,000 Americans died of heart attack. More Americans died from Viox than died in the Vietnam War. Now, you might say, what's standing up against this? Again, back to the therapeutics initiative. In BC, the prescribing of Viox was actually very low. Well, why was that? Well, it's because this group at UBC was doing analyses of the clinical trials and telling doctors, you have to be very cautious. There are some signals. We think that there are some safety problems with this treatment, and please uh, don't be so aggressive in prescribing it. 
which was a really good thing because we estimate that there might have been 500 to 1,000 lives saved in British Columbia by doctors not prescribing this treatment. At the end of the day, you might say, well, what, do this, what does the medical profession think of all this? What do, what do doctors think about this? This is the front cover of the BMJ, and I can tell you, the first time I saw this, my, my, the axis of my world tilted somewhat. This is the front cover of one of the world's biggest medical journals depicting doctors. By the way, the, 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 uh, uh, the issue was all about the interaction between doctors and the drug industry. And this cover depicts doctors as pigs at a table with lizards who happen to be, I think, the pharmaceutical reps. The lizards and the pigs are playing golf up there on the left. And you see up on the right there, there is the lecture because, of course, it's a scientific meeting and the lizard is speaking in the ear of the specialist. Now, I can tell you when the British Medical Journal puts this on their front page, the revolution is on, folks. <laughs> the revolution is on. And by the way, I have to point out the the patient that you see in the bottom right-hand corner is a guinea pig. <laughs> the, the guinea pig is you and I. We're the ones around which all of this prescribing and activity happens. You know, these people, I think, are champions of medicine's next revolution. This is an emergent world where people are starting to say, like Semmelweis, we have to wash our hands of harmful practices. Okay? And I think that the revolution that's underway I invite you to be part of it. You know, people nowadays ask their doctors, would you wash your hands before you treat me or to the nurse? Because that's a common thing that, you know, we know that bacteria is eliminated by hand washing. I would say we should go for a step further and maybe ask our physicians, is it time that you washed your hands of the influence of the pharmaceutical companies? Because, you know, we got to get this pool to be a little bit bigger. <laughs> Thank you.